On this day of discovery, author and Cornerstone University President Joe Stowell travels to modern Turkey to one of the most impressive excavations of a city of the Roman Empire, Ephesus. In the first century, Ephesus was home to a growing church led by the Apostle John, once the young disciple of Jesus Christ. John's belief in Jesus as the resurrected Savior of the world offended the worship and loyalty to the many gods of the Roman Empire, which included Caesar. John was therefore imprisoned on the island of Patmos, 50 miles off the coast of Turkey. It is on Patmos that Jesus suddenly appears to John with a vision that maps out the end of time. This final book in the Bible is known as the Revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a book that for many speaks of a terrible future for the world and mankind, culminating with judgment and God's wrath being poured out on the earth. But this final revelation of Jesus Christ unveils far more than a final world war and cosmic destruction. It also reveals a yet future time of restoration and peace, a time when suffering and tears will cease. The book begins by revealing the heart of the resurrected Jesus for those he's left behind, with seven personal letters to seven first century churches within the borders of modern Turkey. The first letter is to the Church of Ephesus. Journey to the seven churches of Revelation, the letter to Ephesus, on this day of discovery. Today, thousands of people from all over the world come to this ancient city of Ephesus. They come to view the spectacular relics, to buy t-shirts for their grandkids and little images to the goddess Artemis who was worshipped here 2,000 years ago. But 2,000 years ago, people came to Ephesus for a whole different reason. From every corner of the globe, people came because this was a world-class city. It's like our New York or Singapore, Paris or Beijing. It was the center of the cult worship to Artemis. Pilgrims came to this massive temple that was one of the seven wonders of the world. And in this city, there was a group of followers of Jesus Christ. This church planted here thrived in the midst of this pagan environment. Headliners like Paul were here for two and a half years, the Apostle John and Timothy. And interestingly enough, the letters that Jesus wrote to the churches of Asia Minor, the very first letter he wrote was a letter to this church in the city of Ephesus. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things, as says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. 
These are the kinds of spectacular ruins that tourists come from all over the world to see. But for early Christians walking through this plaza, this was the library. One of the greatest libraries in the world, reminding them that they were in an intellectual center. As they would walk through these archways, they would see over the top the inscription to Caesar Augustus, who is God? And it would remind them of the worship of the emperors that created so much tension in their lives. Just over here is the town brothel right out in the public, which would again remind them of the seduction of the rampant sexual immorality in Ephesus. But through those arches is where the action really happened, the town market, the Agora. The Agora was the most important trade center in Ephesus. It was in the form of a large square, surrounded by columns with three gates. I've entered through the gate from the Celsus Library. Three sides of the Agora were surrounded by a portico that held the shops doing business in this commercial center. Ephesus was a port city, and goods from all over the known world were sold right here in this place. No city tells us what life was like for early Christians in the Roman Empire, like the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was affluent. It sat on the edge of a major seaport. So trade from literally all over the known world parked its ships in the seaport and filled the city with goods that were much coveted by people who came from land routes. Trade routes on land ended up here in Ephesus. So Ephesus was a rich town and it was very cosmopolitan. People from all over the world lived here, Jews and Gentiles and Persians. And, and most of the activity that was significant took place right here in the Agora or the marketplace. The Agora would have been filled with the fragrant aromas of spices from far and distant lands, with the beautiful colors of textiles that had been woven and brought here for sale. Uh, people would gather here socially. I mean, this was like a mall on steroids, really. This was the center of life in Ephesus and the center of life in most cities in the Roman Empire. And so what would happen here would be largely determinative of the social interactions and status of early Christians. Of course, one challenge was that at the entrance to the Agora was an incense burner. In order to enter the Agora on good terms, you had to take a little incense as an act of loyalty to the emperor who claimed to be Lord and drop it in the incense burners. Christians struggled with that. It was tough to navigate that, to be, to be shut out of the agora meant to be shut out of so much of life. But that was the challenge for them. Ephesus was typical of the environment in which early Christians needed to navigate, not only for its marketplace and agora, but for its worship of pagan deities. In Ephesus, there were 14 temples, idolatrous temples to pagan gods, but none of them rivaled the temple to Artemis. Artemis was the ancient goddess of fertility and life. Uh, her reign over this region and most of the Roman Empire actually started in 1000 BC, and Ephesus was the headquarters of her worship. The temple was one of the seven wonders of the world, Think of this, it was a, bigger than a football field and a half long and wider than a football field. It was wrapped with 127 massive pillars of marble. I mean, it was a statement. And all of the town worshiped at the temple. In fact, the worship of Artemis pervaded almost every aspect of life and of society, all the way to banking and commerce. Uh, the Temple to Artemis became a banking headquarters where people would bring their money and merchants would bank their money and the temple would receive the interest and you'd get loans and so it was a very central point in this city. There were in the Temple of Artemis, given that she was the goddess of fertility, hundreds of temple prostitutes, both male and female. Many of the festivities celebrating Artemis ended in, in orgies and rampant sexual immorality. Think of the challenge that that meant 
to early Christians. And once a year in May, to celebrate her birthday, this, called the Sacred Way, was filled with massive processions of thousands of people lifting Artemis's picture at the front of the procession with music playing and dancing and cheering all the way down to the harbor where the statues of Artemis would be dipped into the water to restore her virginity again. And then the massive celebration returned to the temple where late into the night they would celebrate and worship her in drunken orgies. And since all the priests to her were eunuchs, some of the men in frenzy would literally castrate themselves and present their dismembered parts to Artemis as an act of worship and become a part of the priesthood. So that was the environment. That was the challenge for the early church to live in a society such as this. But the challenge really, at the end of the day, didn't compare to the worship of the Emperor Domitian, which was also headquartered in this city. Ephesus had the high honor of being a neo-choros. <laughs> Uh, that meant a city that was a host to a temple to an emperor. Uh, very few cities got that honor. Ephesus had to. Down below us in a valley in the first century BC, a temple was built to Augustus, the divine. But behind me is the temple to Domitian, built on the highest place in the town of Ephesus so that all could see. Uh, Domitian began his reign in 81 and immediately selected this place for people to worship him as God. Interestingly enough, on the plateau of the temple where the temple actually stood was a structure that was held up by other statues. These were the statues of all the gods of the empire. <laughs> what a statement that the other gods of the empire literally hold him up as the highest. And on the platform, on the plaza of the temple, was a statue to Domitian himself. Get this, it stood 50 feet tall with an arm raised in power. And when you would come into the harbor, you would look up, it's the first thing you would see in Ephesus was this statue of Domitian. For early Christians, that was a very intimidating sight because Domitian, next to Nero, is one of the emperors that most brutally persecuted the early church. In fact, sometimes I wonder if that vision of Jesus Christ as being all-powerful and almighty uh, was meant to contrast to these kind of iconic images of the emperors and all their power that, that Christ appears in far greater power than they appear. So as intimidating as that may have been, uh, Worse yet was the challenge to early Christians, because in the imperial cult, one of the ways that the emperors held the Roman Empire together was to claim to be God. Actually, they used names like Savior, and Lord, and Master, Son of Man, and God. So how do you hold an empire together that's made up of so many different kinds of people and cultures? Well, you have one element, and that is all of the empire will worship the emperor, will worship Caesar. And there were festivities and times in the year when Christians were required, when all the Roman citizens and all the Roman towns were required to publicly affirm with their own voice that Caesar is Lord. Well, through many of the em emperor's reign, and that didn't have a lot of glue to it, didn't stick, and Christians kind of flew under the radar. But not with Domitian because he was intent that all would praise and worship him, hence the massive persecution. So the church of Ephesus then lived under the shadow of this seduction. And in fact, John is exiled onto the Isle of Patmos because of dynamics represented in a temple just like this. Another unsettling reality for early Christians was the presence of demons and demon activity. Oracles were priests to the gods and the goddesses, and they spoke for the gods and goddesses. Here at Ephesus, they dwelt in the temple to Didymus. 
uh, oracles would do miraculous wonders, all driven by the underworld, cast spells on enemies and curses and, and whip worshippers into convulsive frenzies, all very evident to Christians that the powers of the demons in the underworld were very much at work. So when Paul wrote to Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6, to put on the whole armor of God, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness in high places, they knew what he meant, and they took him seriously. And Paul was asking them not to just stand against the government or for a cause that judges others. Read his letter to Ephesus sometime. He calls them to live a life in the midst of this community that says something that rings true in all of our hearts. Things like, forgive your enemies, show love and compassion to all, honor your father and mother, or bring your children up in the admonition of the Lord, and bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters. And masters, you've got to give up threatening, knowing you too have a master in heaven. Paul admonishes them to sincerity and goodwill in a community that worshiped gods who said nothing like this. In short, he was asking them to be like Christ in a Christ-denying world. Jesus writes his first letter to the church here at Ephesus. Unlike some of the other churches, there is no hint in this letter of compromise on their part. Now, quite frankly, given all the pressures, that would have been an easy thing. I mean, why not just take a pinch of incense to honor the emperor, to go into the marketplace and be socially accepted, or, or, or go to the festivities and eat meat offered to idols, and uh, perhaps even participate in sexual immorality just to keep your position and your career and have people still shopping at your little stall. Um, actually, Jesus says, you hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were a sect in the early church who uh, absorbed Greek philosophy and its Gnosticism, and which basically taught uh, that the body was insignificant, that the only thing that was valuable was the soul, so whatever is done in the body or to the body is to no avail. Therefore, you could eat meat offered to idols and participate in sexual immorality. So they took a firm stand against that. So I wonder why they were so strong. Could it be that they had great leadership? The Apostle Paul was here for three years. The first six months he taught in a synagogue, uh, but the resistance of the Jews was so heavy that he went to the Hall of Tyrannus, an open meeting place where Stoics and philosophers marketed their wares. And um, he taught there every day, Acts tells us, from 11 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon for two and a half years so that all the known world would know about the power of the risen Christ. And they were so effective in being distinct um, that the silversmiths rioted. <laughs> uh, silversmiths would make these little statues to Artemis and people would buy them and put them in their homes and worship Artemis in their homes. Uh, but the influence of early Christianity in Ephesus was so powerful that they started losing business. And so they rioted and the whole town went into the massive theater shouting for two hours straight, Artemis, the goddess of the Ephesians, Artemis, the goddess of the Ephesians. And they dragged some of Paul's cohorts in there and were getting ready to drag Paul in there too. Who knows what would have happened to him in that riot, uh, except the town governor quieted the crowd and said, we have courts to take care of this. But all of that to say, this was a very effective church. So Jesus Christ starts by commending them, throwing bouquets at them. I know your labor and your toil. I know that you endure hardship for my name's sake. I know that you do not uh, accept false teachers. I mean, after that list, you and I would vote for them as Church of the Year. But then Jesus says, but I have something against you. I have to say, I never want to hear Jesus say that to me. Literally, the word first means first in terms of priority, motivation, the thing that's most important to me. And I'm wondering with all those accolades of the wonderful things they're doing as a church, 
If Jesus is saying to them, you're not doing those because you love me. That church for you is like a habit. It's like a project. It's like a duty. It's like getting the work done. It's like sticking it out and staying faithful. But it's not because you love me that you do this. It's kind of like loveless labor. It's like work without wonder. It ends up being kind of dry and boring at the end of the day. Jesus warns them, if, if you don't change this, I'll remove your lampstand, which in essence he was saying, uh, just doing loveless labor, no matter how good it is, you lose your effectiveness. You lose the light in the darkness, the power of your church. I guess Jesus wants us to know that he longs for a relationship, not just behavior, not just duty. Um, every once in a while, Marty leaves after dinner to go out shopping with friends or something. And so I decide, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to clean the kitchen up. And I wash the pots and pans and I put the dishes in the dishwater washer. And then at the end of it, the kitchen looks spotless. It looks great. And she comes home and notices it. She says, oh my goodness, Joe, why did you do this? And I say, well, because I'm dedicated to the institution of marriage. That's why I did this. <laughs> no, I mean, that would go nowhere. I just look in her eyes and say, I did this because I love you. You're the most important person in my life. I look for ways to tell you how much I love you. And that's what Jesus is after. And so he tells them to repent. And if they repent, they'll do the works they did at first. Which means that if you love Jesus and therefore do what he would have you do, you might get outside of the church walls. As good as your behavior is on the inside, you might start caring for the poor again, doing acts of compassion toward those infants who are thrown on the town dump. You might start ministering to people in need, even loving and forgiving your enemies. So that's what Jesus calls them to. I do think there's a modern application here because it's real easy, isn't it? To be duty and to do things without doing them because you love Jesus. All of our work should be worship to him. That's what he really longs for. This is what is left of the Temple of Artemis after standing here in all of its glory, attracting pilgrims from all over the known world. In 262, when the Goths plundered Ephesus, they destroyed this temple. And given the Christianization of the Roman Empire, it was never built again. So goes one of the wonders of the world. But while we're here, Jesus Christ, at the end of his letter to the Christians in Ephesus, made an interesting reference to this temple. He said to them, to those of you who overcome, I will give the tree of life. Artemis was the goddess of fertility and life. And one of the great symbols of that was in the outer courtyards, there stood a gigantic tree. This tree symbolized life. Women hoping to become pregnant would come there and touch the tree. People who wanted health and life in more abundance would come to the tree. It was the source of hope and the fullness of life for Ephesians. Of course, Christians didn't participate in that. It would have been easy for them to feel cheated, to be left out of one of the great opportunities of Ephesus. But Jesus says that if you stay faithful to me, in the end, I will give you the tree of life, the eternal tree of life. And then he said, which is in the paradise of God, so what would that mean? Well, emperors had glorious palatial gardens, and it was in those gardens that they would entertain guests of honor. Well, most citizens would never hope to go to the emperor's gardens, to their paradiso, their paradise, let alone Christians. But think of the imagery. These emperors who persecuted them and marginalized them, that the day would come when they would go be with their God and he would give to them the tree of life, planted in the very paradise of God. All of the letters run like this. Stay faithful, and I have a great reward for you, something far better than this world could ever give. And it reminds me of Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, For those of you who endure for my name's sake, great is your reward in heaven. <laughs>